Jenna, who's the president of the ACLU Local Milwaukee chapter. Thanks, Sharon. I think we might just, let's just give it a minute or two, Another just because I two? see she's letting in the, um, they're letting in some more attendees. So let's just maybe, just give it one more minute and then I'll go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for um, joining us for our um, ACLU's uh, Milwaukee Chapter Board annual meeting. Um, obviously, we don't normally do our annual meeting on Zoom, so um, bear with us as we work our way through this. But my name is Molly Gina. I'm the um, current president of our of our chapter board, and um, welcome everyone. Just a couple really quick things before I turn it over to Sharon. Um, so I just wanted to kind of mention, um, you know, this has obviously been a strange year for our board, just like it has been for everyone um, with, with COVID-19 and everything that's, that's been going on. Um, we weren't able as a board to do um, as many events uh, as we would normally maybe try to do in a year. Our uh, civil liberties on tap just didn't happen this year without being able to have in-person meetings. And quite honestly, this is actually our first event um, that, our, that our board is putting on. So we finally got it together to do this on Zoom. The affiliate, of course, has had many Zoom events, but our chapter board, just um, uh, this is our first one, um, which is, of course, our annual meeting. And uh, for folks who, who um, are members of the ACLU, and if you're not a member, we do encourage you to, uh, to join and become a member. Uh, then you can receive emails uh, um, regarding events and the things that our chapter board is doing. But um, you might know that we would normally be holding an election for our board. We do that at every annual meeting, um, and that's not happening this time. The affiliate has allowed us to, we had uh, four uh, board members um, whose terms were up this year, and, and everyone wanted to, to stay on the board, and the affiliate allowed us to just extend and give them uh, another term instead of trying to figure out an election on top of trying to just figure out how to, how to do an annual meeting on Zoom and all of those things. So um, we are, you know, considering some other moves for the board, potentially amending the bylaws and really kind of looking at elections and, and why we do them and how we do them, but that is all to come. So um, to get updates on all of those things, please do watch your email, join, become a member, and, and then you can get emails from us to kind of know what the chapter board is up to. Um, in, including regarding elections and things, but also regarding any events that we're having. One of the main, you know, I think focuses of the board since the pandemic and everything that's been going on has really been um, legal observing at all of the protests, all the very necessary protests that have been going on. Um, and particularly two of our chapter board members, Elise and Matt, have really been um, organizing our, um, our legal observing and making sure um, that we can uh, be there and get volunteers to, to be at these protests for that, which is really important work. So that's kind of a focus that um, I would say our chapter board has been has been doing in this past year. But hopefully we can speak now that we're figuring out how to how to do these events this way. Um, we'll be able to hold more events like this. So um, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for our panelists for being here. And I'm going to uh, turn it over to Sharon. Thank you, Molly. So hello everyone, I am Sharvon Carlson. I am currently the vice president of our local uh, ACLU Wisconsin chapter board. And thank you for coming to our talk discussion about rethinking police policing and dismantling racism. So what I wanna do first is introduce you to our panelists who have graciously agreed to come and share their thoughts and opinions and knowledge with us. And I'm really grateful that they, they took this time to do this with us. Our panelists are Keisha Robinson. She is the program director of the Black Leaders Organizing for Communities block. We have Kenneth Jinlak, who is an LCSW, CSAC, ISC, I'm sorry, I don't know the full names, um, director of outpatient services with Milwaukee County Behavioral Health Division. We have Brianna Canales with UWM Fellow and Leaders Igniting Transformation Lit. And Mariah Cruz-Alice, 
for us, our social worker. So again, thank you panelists. And so I'm gonna start with the question that we sent out. Um, thinking about the systems of response we have in place beyond policing can also reproduce racism. So the first question, what are the experiences of clients in those systems? And then the next question would, and then the follow-up question, I'll ask follow-up. You'll have about 10 minutes for each response. Um, we can start with Kenneth, if you don't mind. Hello. Um, can you repeat the question again? I sure can. Okay. Thinking about the systems of responses we have in place beyond policing can also reproduce racism. So first question is, what are the experiences of clients in those systems? What? Yeah, I'm on the webinar. Okay, um, being that in the LCSW, I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a um, clinical substance abuse counselor. Um, so I'm very familiar with um, different systems. Um, I have worked in the, in the hospital setting as well in the emergency department. Um, and when it comes to mental health and actually um, crisis services, there are a lot of people that show up in, um, in the emergency department um, for services. Um, some are, are homeless and, and some have mental health issues, um, substance use disorder issues. Um, however, you know, um, upon arriving to emergency departments and um, actually in, in the community as well, um, there is a, a lack of access to services. Um, being a social worker in the emergency department, when, when um, people showed up, um, individuals showed up suffering with mental health issues, um, there was nowhere to go. Um, some was frowned upon because of um, because of the you know the lack of um, residency, the lack of um, places to actually go um, to get mental health services. Um, not only that, um, there's a lack of black clinicians and therapists in the in the community as well. Um, something that I am very passionate about um, getting others to to join into those services. So. And when it comes to our youth as well, um, responding to um, services as far as like calling the crisis mobile team or the um, the, um, the crisis mobile team. And and also I'm trying to think of the youth. It used to be called Mutt Team, but it's not that anymore. But they used to go out and respond to youth, um, primarily African-American youth um, that I see in, the, in like group homes and different settings and responding um, to them. However, it was a lack of, um, I say, I should say cultural awareness or even understanding the youth that they were responding to um, was very hard to build rapport um, because they didn't really understand the youth or they don't understand the youth in the inner city. Um, I see a shift in that now, but you know, at the time I had witnessed um, providers or therapists responding and just because they could not, they could not connect with the youth um, and really didn't, couldn't really relate to what they were going through. Um, it was a lack of, um, I wouldn't say empathy, but however it was a, it was hard for them to reach, you know, and not only that, you know, even in the community and the adults, you know, when, when they are called out, when they call for services, um, community, the, um, the mobile team, when they go out as well, you know, um, sometimes they just don't understand the culture. Um, us as black people, and because I'm a black male, um, I never believed in the system. Um, and so, we was always taught to handle our own issues and not call the police. You know, if you call the police out, you know, um, you was more, and, and I'm gonna talk from my experience. Um, 
I have called the police um, in my younger years for different issues. And even though I was the victim, I was treated more as the, um, the perpetrator, I should say, or the person that was actually um, committing the crime. You know, um, they wanted to see my ID. They wanted to ask questions. They started asking me, what did I do wrong? And I'm calling you for help. So, you know, um, this is the experience of many people in the, in the black community. You know, when you call out for services, um, you treat it more as a victim. And I, I would say people just didn't understand. They like, you had to do something wrong for this to happen to you. You know, for someone to um, violate your rights, like you did something wrong. And, and so that was my experience um, growing up. I still see it today. Um, people are very reluctant. Um, you call a system or you call, um, I, I'll just say, the police for an issue. Um, and I have witnessed the police calling Child Protective Services and women and, you know, families losing their, their children um, because of the response. Um, I'll, I'll give a very personal issue and, and I'll sum it up real quick. Um, when I was younger, in my 20s, I called, uh, my furnace went out and I called and the guy came in to look at the furnace. Um, he quoted me a price. I was unable to pay the price and I told him I would get back with him. Um, and in return, he left and he called Child Protective Services and reported that the children was living in the house without heat. And so that launched the whole investigation on, you know, um, they wanted to come out, they wanted to look and look around the house, they wanted to see was we live in there without heat. And, and so, you know, very simple phone call just to actually get a service provided ended up going through, a, um, my family ended up going through a whole investigation as far as like um, child neglect or, you know, um, being put in the system for investigation, and, you know, so calling the school, try to see what type of parents we were. So, you know, those type of experiences um, in the black community is, is not unheard of. It's, you know, um, also being that a social worker, I work with a, with a, um, with a grassroots organization um, actually called Calm Force. Um, I was pretty active with them and so, when someone in the community was experiencing a mental health issue, um, experienced a traumatic event for far as seeing a, a, a crime committed, um, we were attempting to have like a social worker come out on spot, talk to the um, family, talk to the, to the um, youth or whoever were, was going through a crisis. Um, and, you know, it, it worked well, but because it's a lack of therapists and because I was working full time, I was able to, I was unable to respond to a lot of um, calls, but it was a need. Um, and then I also was told that because I'm a, a, a licensed social worker that people don't trust you can. So now I'm, I'm also looked at as part of the, of the system because um, I'm a mandated reporter and people are just don't trust the system. And, and so they're reluctant to ask for help. And, and that's something that I want to see change too, um, as we talk about defunding the police. And I know I went on on a couple of different um, scenarios, but I just wanted to make that point um, clear that, you know, the lack of trust in the system has been um, incorporated in the community for years, you know, and even go back to when I was a child that, you know, it was like, you never go to school and tell people your business. You don't tell them what's going on in this household. So it was generations of, you know, um, if you tell what's really going on with you, that it will be some repercussions and, and some consequences behind it. Thank you. Thank you. Mariah. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, that's kind of a hard answer to follow. <laughs> it's really well spoken, kind of. Um, so uh, my experience is I am a case manager under the umbrella of child welfare. Um, and 
at the point of contact I have with my families is usually after an initial investigation has been done. Um, and so what I have seen is one of the really big examples of how the system works, I guess, against our families is the definition of what is a family. Um, and so we've talked about this, I think, at my agency a few times with groups of people. And I just watched um, an online conference this week with the uh, University of Houston. It's upending. Um, I'm going to have to get back to you on the name because now I can't think of it. But one of the big things they talked about was this definition of family. And they looked at um, Native American um, reservations as like what their view on it is too, because our definition of family is like our biological family or married to, but in other communities, or I should say our definition legally, but in, in communities, family is, you know, like my mom's best friend or who you have really close relationships with. And sometimes our children are removed from their families or who they identify as family because they're not biological relatives and then they become unlicensable. And so when they're not licensable to be a foster parent, then they become an illegal placement um, if they're not a relative. And so our kids get split up that way. Um, and so we try to be as creative as possible. Um, we try to get like can approvals, but again, sometimes those don't work or um, if, if a family can't be licensed. And so we see that happen often in our community because you know a lot of the things that people need to have or do to be licensed it's like things like their square footage of the bedroom of the youth that they're sharing in or um if a youth is i think or child is six they can't share with um a bedroom with children who are not the same gender as them um and so even sibling relationships or you know cousins they can't then share bedroom and that becomes um, a, a strain on families sometimes. There are exceptions though, like we can make exceptions, but I, again, I'm not a licensing worker. I just know that this is a barrier that some of our families experience. Um, but then there's the, the calls for neglect. I know that our, our, our uh, minority populations have many more calls and are disproportionate to the population of the amount of children in care that are of minority populations. Um, I can speak of a family that I wor worked with once upon a time. And I like to use her as an example because she came from um, like anything and everything that you can think of against someone, she had it against her. Young mom, abusive relationship, family history of addiction, homeless, physical abuse towards her children, not by her, but by others, um, medical conditions, like just anything that you can think of she was going through or had gone through in her life, including being in foster care in, in her past. And we worked really hard with her. Uh, we were really creative. We didn't have this her, uh, list of services that she had. Um, and she was able to become really successful, be reunified with her children been a few years now she's been reunified she's doing really well she moved out of Milwaukee um, and unfortunately um, there have been and she's called me about this there have been more calls to CPS um, because the school district knows her history and a teacher was concerned about this child's shoes being broken when she explained like I'm not gonna buy her a new pair of shoes every week because she's really rough on them and she's not taking care of them and so if her shoe has a rip in it, then that's a natural consequence um, to her not caring for her things. And so she kept getting these calls and she was really frustrated. And she reaches out to her old team, like, what can I do? And um, I think one of the things that we taught her to do really well is to advocate for herself. And so as I'm thinking about, you know, at the point a family comes in contact with the system, there are so many other systems or other um, opportunities where families get advocates. And I think that what our system is really missing is advocates for our families at the, the initial point of contact, right? They need someone who is going to help them understand what's going on, explain to them besides their case managers, um, because the trust between case managers and 
families usually isn't there in the beginning because we're coming in under a crisis. Um, we're coming in under a time where their family is under a lot of stress. And so, you know, as a case manager, as much as I want to be, um, I, I don't want to say liked by, but like as much as I want to be trusted by my families to know that I'm really trying here to try to help you and have your family be whole again, we don't get that, that trust right away. And so how else can we bring in more family, more supports, natural supports, or if we have to do formal supports as advocates in the beginning, then let that be and help make the fa help the families work towards having their informal supports. So that way, when we do leave, we never see them. I say often um, to my families and people I, I talk to about my job is if our job was 100% sex uh, successful every time, or even like not even more than 50% of the time, eventually we won't have jobs and that's a good thing to say like I want to be unemployed because there's no families that have to be come in contact with child protective services because that means that our kids are safe our families are safe and they're healthy and whole thank you Mariah Keisha hello everybody um so the there, the system, we all know that systemic uh, racism is the one of the number one reasons um, that we are experiencing a lot of these difficulties. Um, just to speak to some of the experiences of clients in these systems, um, let's start with healthcare. Um, so often people in these communities, like I know of a, a lot of uh, young people, they have to make an appointment. And one particular young lady, she had uh, three kids that she wanted to make an appointment for, and she called for transportation. So they tell her that they are unable to give her the transportation if she doesn't have um, two car seats to put the kids in. And it's like, okay, this um, transportation is covered under insurance, and you would think they will be equipped with that in these communities. Um, and so that person was forced to reschedule their appointment, and they offered, okay, well, we'll see you bus tickets. Like what kind of response to that, um, what kind of response is that to a parent whose child is suffering from bronchial asthma for a, a child that can't get on a bus and go out in this weather to go receive this treatment? So things like that. And then you have schools. So back in the days, in my opinion, I feel that they took all the originality out of the schools and the programs and things. Um, they yanked it from these kids and then they tell them find something to do. And then when they engage in negative behaviors, we have the, the, the jail and the, the prison waiting on you. Um, a lot of consequences or uh, reprimands and stuff for people in our communities is always the end result is jail. When you get to, when you put the police in the school, um, what kind of motivation is that? What happens to the music and art programs, um, band, things like that? Um, so when these students, these kids, these teenagers in these communities hear about the other um, schools in different areas, they still have all that original things in their school. Their schools are thriving. But what do we have? We have tons of middle and high school students that would like a better education, but you ripped everything out of their schools. You close most of the schools, you put them all together, and then you tell them to learn. And then you put police in there as an afterthought. Um, so like this is the conclusion, and that is nowhere that that is not fair. It's just um, it's just not fair. And then speaking to the housing, um, the housing market for rentals has gone up a lot. People are paying a tremendous amount just to keep a roof over their head. The the um, I, I remember a couple of years back when uh, Scott Walker was in, he signed something um, that gave landlords more protection. How fair is that to the renter? Um, that still has to pay for this unit that was damaged, that was in filth, that was that had rodents and things like that. Um, and then you follow up with that with telling us in these neighborhoods, well, first we have to do a credit check for you to get this rental. You have to have a certain amount of income. You have to not had any evictions in the last five or ten years, no matter what your you know um, income um, situation was. You can't have any evictions at all. It's like everything that is put for us in these communities always has to have a hard or almost impossible stigma attached to it for you to gain, um, for you to become sustainable. 
Um, so let's let's talk about with the housing. Um, people that want to become home buyers, they say that uh, persons of color, we we are low when it comes to buying houses, things like that. But look at some of the qualifications. We got to have credit scores that's that's up to the roof, regardless of how we are living, what we are um, able to to be uh, to attain. And so it's just the systems like you can't. In my opinion, there is no system that you can point out right now that favors black folks except for the prison system. And it doesn't favor us. It um it it it's the one system that the the end result for us, we get the most out of that system, is what I should say. We get all the time. We get the harsh treatment. Um and so I think people that systemic racism is bad and it's just it moves to our schools, it moves to our homes, it's in our jobs. Um, and then with the lead water, lead water has been a problem here in Milwaukee, especially on the north side of Milwaukee, for like for for so long. And they're the only thing I've seen that for them to um the only thing I've seen is them just they know that it's affecting our kids. They know they they refuse to give them counseling, they refuse to give them the help, but they definitely would give them the jail sentence. When they feel like they're um, they're committing this kind of crime, and there's nothing wrong with them, it's just that they're they're angry, they're this and this and that, and we always just get the bad end of the stick. Um, and the last thing I will say to that, um, I know of a situation of someone that is so bad that even and I spoke on this before. Um, I know of a family moved from one zip code, five three two zero six. Uh, to another one. And just from moving from that zip code to the next zip code, they were able to get better internet service, better speed, Wi-Fi. And it's like, why? And how was that? Like, no matter what, people talk about the stigma of the Black community, but if all they're being, if all we're being thrown is crap, how do we make light out of that? Well, we can't ourselves just get up and change the system. So essentially, we're just stuck. Thank you, Keisha. And last but not least, Brianna. Hi, everyone. Um, so to answer the question, um, I think I definitely want to shed light on the college experience because as it was mentioned, I'm um, a lit fellow at UW-Milwaukee. Um, and I've had a lot of conversations with my peers and fellow community members who think that healthcare, policing, schooling, and all of our systems are deeply divided. Um, but honestly, I think that they bleed into each other a lot more than it may seem like. Um, our systems definitely influence and impact one another. Um, so when talking about um, our systems, I wanna talk about how policing has affected our systems. Um, so again, from the college perspective, um, as a lit, as lit at Milwaukee, we recently talked about um, and looked at the 2018 campus security report um, to kind of just see what's going on, what's happening on campus. Um, so campus police reported 922 drug and alcohol arrests and disciplinary actions. Yet in comparison, there were only 86 reports of all other types of crime combined. So that's sexual violence, burglary, robbery, arson, um, and all other crimes that kind of fall into that category. Um, so looking at that, um, it really becomes easy to ask ourselves, how is it that campus policing um, or campus police are ticketing college students for essentially taking part in the college experience at 10 times the rate of actual crimes. Um, so again, that means that in 2018 um, through 2019, there, there was a problem, there was a divide. Um, and again, um, in that same year, there were $3 billion um, given to essentially give students a, a slap on the wrist. Um, and so I wanna look at the comparison again um, realizing that our systems impact each other. Um, one in particular would be our cultural centers. Um, in the same year, UWM only allocated $240,000 to the Black Cultural Center. So if UWM divested from policing and reinvested that lump sum of money, um, which again was only used for ticketing people, they would be reinvesting in their BIPOC students they claim to represent. Um, there are many other resources that do not run efficiently or as effectively um, due to the small budget that they have 
or <clears throat> um, like the lack of resources that they run on. Um, and so a specific example is UWM has a be on the safe side transportation service. And so it's essentially a campus taxi or think of it like a campus Uber. Um, and so it runs right now it runs um, and these hours are definitely affected with COVID. Um, but it runs essentially from six until two in the morning. Um, and I've had a lot of conversations with students who say that they've been stuck waiting um, for 20 minutes just to get in the queue. Um, and on top of that, they've been stuck a, an additional 15 to 30 minutes to actually be put like accepted and say that they're, they're be able to track how far somebody is away from them. Um, and as we know, crime, harassment, all of those unethical decisions don't wait. They are not like, oh, you have a scheduling conflict. I'm gonna wait until it's a perfect time, no. Crime doesn't wait. Our services that are helping us, that are serving us, should not wait either. Um, and students shouldn't have to wait on campus. Fearful, they shouldn't be scared at dark. I mean, really thinking about it, um, that really comes out to like, what, 40 minutes that somebody's stuck waiting and you have no idea where these students are waiting at. Um, somewhere in the dark, somewhere next to somebody that might have made them feel uncomfortable. Um, and so, um, the wait time speaks for itself, as I've just mentioned. Um, and um, the money that's not going to them, um, but could be going to them if we reinvested it, could be going to reconstructing the scheduling app or hiring more staff and more vehicles. Um, because BOSS, the staff that runs BOSS has said that they don't have the money to hire enough people to, to drive the buses, to buy enough vehicles to still, because it's a campus of 25,000 people. Um, and so maybe not all of those people are using the services, but a lot of them are. And there aren't even half as many buses trying to help those people. Um, and so separate from that example of where the reallocation money could go, um, it's important to just think about how armed officers on campus promote anxiety, fear of harassment, and overall stress to BIPOC students um, who definitely deserve to attend their campus without fear. Um, and the same amount of like integrity, like BIPOC students deserve to feel the same amount of integrity as their white counterparts do. Um, and another example, um, when asked, you know, what is this experience of clients? Um, speaking from my own perspective, I was pulled over and um, I'm from a predominantly white town. Um, so I already knew that I essentially stick out to a sort as a sore thumb, especially in the climate that we're in. Um, and that definitely you know, allows me to feel very fearful, um, even when something might not seem like to my white counterpart, it might not seem like um, that big of a deal. I'm being pulled over to somebody that might not seem like a big situation, but to me it definitely is, regardless of whatever the reason is. So when I was pulled over, I was grilled for a bunch of different um, questions, um, but one of which was, am I a good kid? Um, and so I felt like I had 20 seconds, a timer flipped, and I felt like I had 20 seconds to explain myself and why I was a good student, because I knew that I was being racially profiled for who you saw on the outside, but not my inside, you know? Um, and I think that that's a very big endangerment. Um, and I think that that, again, influences our other systems. Um, and so I responded and I felt like I had to explain my whole life story. Um, and so again, when a student goes through something like that and then tries to go to school afterwards, that's again, a direct influence. How can somebody get out of that mentality that they are literally seen as a weapon to somebody that's supposed to protect them? It can infect, it can affect our, you know, our, um, our ability to do well in school. Um, it can affect retention rates in school. Um, so there are definitely a lot of ways that it bleeds into our systems. Um, general anxiety, um, impacting depression. Again, those are things that, um, if not schooling, it can affect how somebody brings themselves to the workplace, the way that they carry themselves. Um, you know, negative experiences can impact so many different things mortality rates, um, incarceration, um, low unemployment, there's low pay. Um, I don't think that there's a shortage of ways that, you know, clients in these systems are being so heavily impacted. And I think that it is absolutely necessary to say, okay, we need to reconstruct these systems or completely break them, them down. And I think that's what divesting from campus policing and reinvesting in campus resources like multicultural center and um, another example is on campus, um, there is no, there's one black psychologist for students to see, but there's no um, black um, therapist. 
So speaking again from my personal perspective, I have gone to therapy um, and I have had somebody um, white as my therapist, again, because there is no black therapist. And they asked me how it felt to have a white therapist that I had to pour out my feelings to. And again, um, you know, there's no docking somebody's education based on their, their race, but it's also a realization that I'm speaking from a perspective that is deeply rooted in my culture. Um, in the family that I am was raised in, what happens in this house stays in this house. We don't talk about it. You know, there's there's definitely a lack of like allowing to you know take medication in my family, and that's coming from a black and Mexican family. Um, so again, it's very important to realize like where these these systems are broken and to fix them because they impact people. It could impact me not seeing that, thinking that oh well then I just shouldn't go to therapy, which again can impact. It's a continuous cycle that needs to be broken. Okay, before I start with the first question that we've given, I have a question of all of you. Um, what, what do you see would be the healthiest way beyond, because here's the thing about rethinking policing and dismantling racism. So there's the calls for abolition of the police departments, um, completely shut them down, dismantle them. And the response has been, okay, yes, and we can bring in these community systems, which we also see that these, the other systems, right, that we think would be more helpful, social services and what have you, also have their issues, uh, also perpetuating. So as was someone once said to me, one is either you get killed quicker and one get killed slowly the way you die. It's not helping you either way. What do you individually see would be the, the system that works? How would that best support the community? What, dream, dream a little with me. What does the system, what does that look like to you um, for our black indigenous population? Um, anyone can go first. I'll say I'll, a system that everybody is held accountable for doing their jobs and what applies to one should apply for all, regardless of what you look like. Um, we are, it is deep. We are really, really deep into things. And it's like, it's crucial now because we're all looking at each other like we know it needs to be done and we know we just don't know how to do it. Um, and it, it involves people empowered, holding each other accountable at those levels that has the say, that has the say so over certain things and makes, make the rules. Um, it's just not enough people, you know, holding each other accountable. They're getting comfortable in their power and they're sitting in it and they're forgetting about the, just to say the little people that really the, it hit, the, the system hits the most. So it's, it's kind of hard, in my opinion, to say where to begin, but yeah, I think accountability. I mean, we talk about it and, and it's definitely needed with the police departments, but we are, um, which why I appreciate this question, we are turning our back on the schools, the jobs, the healthcare, all those systems, um, um, we experience oppression from them. And so to say, you know, to dream a little bit and say, how can we fix it is, is hard. Um, Cause there's so many levels of unpacking of trauma and damage that has been done to where you almost got to scratch and start over. So how do we do that? So yeah, I'll, that's just my edit. Okay. Thank you, Keisha. Brianna, I see your R, Ken. Oh, go ahead, Brianna. I go next. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that that's a great question. Um, and to echo what um, Keisha said, I think that um, it's important to really realize the accountability. Um, I think to these systems, um, but also to ourselves to hold these systems accountable because I think that, you know, this, this fight, this, um, you know, liberation is not a half it's not a half effort thing, you know? Um, and I think that if these systems could, they would sit comfortably, they would not change. Um, and so I think that this continuous effort to hold them accountable um, and realizing that 
just because a system protects us or historically has been known to protect us, it doesn't mean that it does. And it doesn't mean that we can't protect ourselves. I think that we fully have the ability to do. I think that um, this policing idea is honestly like it's it's something of a social construct you know it's it hasn't it doesn't need as much emphasis until those people put emphasis on it um but also realizing that any group of people can have that same emphasis to protect us they can have that same power to protect us multicultural services can protect us reinvesting and being on the safe side can protect us there's safe walkers who don't need necessarily to have like you know a gun or a badge that makes them feel that they're so powerful over certain races um, that they can't protect us. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely think accountability. I think um, realizing that our groups like multicultural services and other other resources on campus, but in general communities like, you know, social workers and all, all those things that mentally are, you know, like minded and they have the knowledge to protect us. Sometimes you don't need a weapon to protect people. You just need knowledge. You just need to be able to sit down and say, okay, what is not working? What can work? What is from our, our, our healthcare systems that works? What is from this that works? But it, it's clear that policing is not doing it. It is, it is poisoned. Thank you. And, and, and thanks. Siobhan for the million dollar question, right? Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and when looking at both systems, yes, they, they both need to be um, restructured. Um, right now, you know, from my standpoint, when we look at from a, oh, well, from a cultural standpoint, when we look at um, other countries, um, when we look at um, even from when I was younger, you know, in the old saying is, you know, it takes a village, right? And so I would like to see, or I think what would be more successful is we start to take care of our own, you know, black and brown communities um, working, to, working together. Um, it was a time and in some cultures, you know, you always went to the elders for advice and the elders actually, took care of the community, you know, and I think we moved so much away from that to start to depend on different systems. You know, it was a time where you could go to your neighbors and say, hey, you know, we don't have anything to eat and, you know, and, and someone to go in the freezer and give you a chicken or give you some flour or, you know, and, and it's, it's now it's a time where you have to rely on a food pantry and you need to show ID and you got to prove that you live here um well you know it, young when back in the day you know it was not like that it was you know we used to leave our front doors open you know and we'll walk in and when you sat down um as maria was talking about you became part of the family you could sit down and watch tv for hours and you know it was just more um community based you know and holding each other accountable and say you know, you, I see you going through a rough time. Send your kids over here, send the children over here. I'll watch them, you know, while you, you know, take care of yourself. And, and we move so much away from that. Now it's, you know, call the system, um, you know, look for a respite or put the children here, you know. And, and so if we can get back to taking care of ourselves per se, you know, and looking at um, the communities as a whole, and, and taking care of each other, I think that would be a, a start. And, and so again, you know, um, I was listening to a talk show and they was talking about credible messengers and, 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 and the violence and, you know, um, being credible to the people that you serve, right? And so when these systems goes out, um, I don't think anyone in the community look at them as credible, they look at them as the system. So, you know, um, I think that'll be a start going back to um, the culture, of, you know, um, of, of family and a village. It takes a village to raise a child or even takes, you know, talking to the elders and that type of thing. So thank you. I guess I will go last now. Um, if I was dreaming, of what would make it easier for our families and our community in these systems, 
um, I would start with saying that everyone has their basic needs met. Um, housing, food, clothing, like not having to worry about any of that. I know I talked about a lot of calls and I guess I don't experience this as a case manager myself because I've only ever had two, two or three cases of mine that didn't involve substance use, like heavy substance use that really puts um, a lot of families and um, and really young kids in danger because there's no one there to care for them then. Um, but besides that, if everyone had their needs met. I think that a lot of the things within the families that causes stress, um, that causes the domestic violence because of stress and because of frustrations and lack of jobs and um, lack of money and, and lack of resources, if that was um, eliminated, I think that there would be much healthier families, much healthier communities. Um, as Keisha had talked about, um, going from one zip code to the next shouldn't determine what resources you get every resource in this city and in this state and in our counties should have the same resources. Um, sure, like maybe if you live in a very rural area, you have to travel a little bit further, but even then, like there's a lot of issues with those people not being able to get their health care and their mental health resources because they have to travel hours. So what can we do to bring health care? What can we do to bring mental health services and resources to our families, um, child care supports, like what does that look like? And so I think if if our families and our community had their basic needs met, like we can't get anywhere else without our basic needs met, we all know that, right? You can't think about your next doctor's appointment, you can't think about, you know, your next, when are you going to care for yourself and your um, caregiver capacity and, and, and how you're going to really make sure that you're there 100% for your kids if you're worried about how you're going to feed them their next meal. Like that's the priority at that moment. It's not about when am I going to relax. Um, and so I think that having your just most basic needs met will help eliminate a lot of the issues that we see and a lot of the cause. I mean, Kenneth talked about a call that was made on him just because he needed a quote for, you know, his furnace. Um, and so if that wasn't an issue, right? If I was able to call someone, my furnace is out and it's winter, can someone help? Like, where can we get resources for that? Besides saying, oh, well, you don't have it. So now this is an issue and you can't care for your kids. That's, that's not him having a furnace going out is, and trying to fix it is not, not caring for kids. And so I think that we have to look at that and like, where do these problems come from? And a lot of it is from our resources. And so just making sure that we all get what we need at the most basic level will put everyone in a fair playing field and really make us a, a full community again. A whole community, I should say, a healthy one. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so I do have other questions, but I'm gonna let the attendees ask questions. <laughs> all right, be all over it. Um, so one of the questions that has come in is um, um, race and class. How do they intersect? Um, mostly in Milwaukee. However, I'm sure we all have experiences. We, I mean, we live in the United States, so we understand the intersection. But let me dig a little deeper into that. And we do have uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color in higher class set systems. And minority minorities, when technically we're not minorities, if we were to stand together we're really not the minority um in rural lower income systems so how do you think that affects either perpetuating the systemic racism that we have is the fact that we're that we have people on the higher end of the ladder helping us or hurting us or you know just your thoughts around that and how it affects what we're talking about in terms of dismantling systemic racism and going beyond policing. And anyone can jump in. I guess I can start. I have a very like specific thing I think about when I hear a question like this. And it's the threshold we use um, to assess families. Um, and not as in, not just workers, right? Like law enforcement and community members. And so there are families that I see who are living in 
wealthier parts of Milwaukee County or wherever, and they have many police reports um, about domestic violence within their family, just like continuous. Some of them are like week after week after week, and no one has ever called Child Protective Services on them. And then you have families who are having similar issues or even less of frequency happening in a much lower income area and they're really quick to call social services then. So in other parts, you know, like other families, they're separating them for the night. They're saying, you go here or, you know, like there's nothing legally happening besides like just intervening, calming the situation down and then moving on. And then our families who are in lower income areas or whatever the case is, are really quickly to get arrested, to get um, social services called, um, to have their kids removed. And so that one to me, it, it screams out at me. And then when I open up, you know, reports and I'm looking at things, I'm like, how did this go on for so long um, in this family? Um, and why was the threshold for them different because they do live in this nice neighborhood and that's not okay and that's not fair to families that's not okay for the family that experienced it over and over and their kids didn't get removed. Like that's not fair to those kids, but it's really also not fair to the, their same um, peers and counterparts that have a lot more involvement with systems much earlier on in a child's life um, because they thought that there was an issue going on. Um, is it, oh, go ahead. um, I'll just add to I, I, the race and class narrative is it's tricky, but when if you are um, a minority or you have it and you are of lower income, it's almost like that you are classified basically as not worth much. And, and so what little you have, it's like many attempts done to be you know, have that taken away um, with little or no help. I think that what I see a lot in Wisconsin, even um, persons of color that live in neighborhoods um, that's predominantly white, even if they have like the same income as that person, they still are often treated, um, you know, in a different type of way. Like some, some areas they do fit in um, if their income level is at a certain range. But, you know, for the most part, um, it, it still, it, it's still the same thing. Like you'll be led to believe that you, you're, we're on the same level, but it's still constant tactics done to make sure that even that person don't succeed. So it's just like, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. Yep. And, and so, you know, when this is, from my perspective and, and looking at, you know, different classes and um, even in neighborhoods that I live in or, or have lived in, um, I'll see white counterparts that's, that's going through the same struggles as, um, as myself or, or, or people in the neighborhood. Um, however, you know, they have a better chance of actually um, getting that or, or, or fulfilling that job or getting a job or have a better chance of um, coming out of that situation because of their color. Um, but, you know, not to take away that, yes, um, they are um, treated differently because of their um, their financial statuses or, or their class. Um, and, and on the other end of the spectrum, I have also witnessed um, men of color that's that's very successful and 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 they always have to and, and and for even for myself i wouldn't say i'm very successful but um i do pretty well for myself um and it's always as though i have to work a little harder right to maintain that status um and always have to prove that you know i'm worthy to be um, where I'm at in life and, and kind of keep that status, you know, you, it's, it's always, it seems to be a spotlight on a successful um, black man or a man of color because um, 
any shortcoming is, 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 is highlighted, it's publicized and, and, and it's made as though, you know, um, they don't belong. So, you know, and, and I know I come from a personal perspective a lot because, you know, um, of my many experiences in life and, you know, again, being a director of, of, of outpatient programming and, um, for the um, entire Milwaukee County, you know, um, is something that I, I'm always aware of. Like, you know, if I make a, a wrong move or if <laughs> if I do something, um, it would be publicized to the point where, you know, I feel as though no matter what status quo or, or what um, class or financial achievement that I, I obtain, that I still have to work a little harder. But um, I mean, to answer the question, yes, I do believe that you know, um, class plays a big part as well as race uh, when it comes to um, discrimination and equality. Um, I can go. Um, so I think that it, this question has a lot to do with perspective. Um, again, coming from a predominantly white um, school, um, we had something in history called Motivation Mondays, and this was in my high school. Um, we had Motivation Mondays and this teacher was very like, um, just very intent on showing that, you know, motivation is from within. And I think he was, it was so intent on it that he kind of forgot about the external factors, you know, like, yeah, motivation, you know, it's somebody's motivation, but external factors can impact what's happening internally. Um, and so he had a quote on his wall um, that again, tied into this motivation um, perspective um, about how if you're born poor, it's not your fault, but if you die poor, it's your fault. And that was the most gross thing I had ever seen. And I heard somebody, my, again, my um, white counterpart and classmate um, and peer say, oh, that's so true. And I just thought how, if I could watch a moment that showed, you know, the systemic racism, the, the prejudice, the literally everything summed up in a moment, I literally just watched it. Like I felt like I had just watched that happen. And it was the most ridiculous thing because these people weren't aware of, you know, mental health issues that happen, racism that happens, bias that happens. There is no shortage of something that could keep somebody from this idea of dying rich, that they have this, you know, this internal ability. And so I think um, the systems that we, you know, we work with and we amplify, if I was, if I was somebody that, um, and at the time, I think I didn't know how to voice my opinion to a teacher, you know, I think that it's hard. Um, but I think that it's all about perspective. And I think realizing like that teacher should have realized what was wrong. But I think that also his counterparts could have said it like coming into his, his workspace, like, I don't, I don't think that that's true. I don't think, and you know, not even just standing up for whatever that person thought, but realizing that there's people in that school that went through different things, that they came from different class perspectives, that they went through different, you know, like family situations. Um, and I think like um, Mariah was saying, it has a lot to do with resources. Like if there is a lack of resources, somebody's not gonna be able to, you know, reach their full potential. And I think that it, it is very gross and very, um, <clears throat> unethical that there has to be this idea of you're rich or you're poor, that there's no in between. It's such a, a black and white space, but really it's gray. It is so incredibly gray. There are so many things that intertwine. And I think that when people stop trying to make it seem like rich is the best and poor is, you know, it, it's this realization that, you know, <laughs> there people can't always change something that happens to them, that there are so many forces that impact something. And I think that, again, that perspective is, is changing our narrative on it, that race and class, where they intersect is not a bad thing. Um, and where they don't, again, not a bad thing, that there are so many different influences of stuff. I agree, I agree. All right, so thank you. Um, so I have two more questions, so, um, which I think, you know, are good ones. So the next question I received is, um, it seems like in many of the examples you guys have given, or you people have given, working on it, um, 
um, about how quickly a call to a system that helps can actually lead to police contact. So even when you call CPS, police is involved. Even when you might call to get food voucher, police might be involved in that as well. Um, I mean, if you think about it, call 911 or 211, and both are 11s. I don't know if anybody ever caught that, but it almost, it's, it's kind of reinforcing that, that thought, that, that system in my mind. Um, we've also heard things like school to prison pipeline. How are the systems of helps? We, I think we've kind of gone over the first part of this is how the systems of help set up to criminalize communities of color, where we see that Kenneth started off with my boiler's broken. I don't want to pay your prices, so I want to shop around. So dudes like, well, just you won't pay my prices. I'm gonna call CPS on you, and I'm gonna get away with it. Now, I'm not gonna get any accountability for it, but you're gonna go through a mess because you refuse to pay my prices that I quoted you to fix your boiler. Most ridiculous thing ever, but uh, I digress. Um, um, so let's, I'm, I'm kind of going to move on to the next one, which is why does seeking social work support mental health, education, or housing often lead to having police encounters and being charged? So again, maybe if you guys could talk about how the police can, is always brought in, even when the call is 211, but 911 shows up. And Mariah, let's start with you. Oh, I need to think on this one only because like with my experience, um, often the police aren't involved with my family at that point, even at the point of like a significant um, call me that launched an investigation. Um, so I think that I guess a lot of people assume that when a CPS call is in, there's also police involvement or uh, police are often calling CPS, um, but I don't know that really any of, of my cases have come in that way. I don't know many of my coworkers whose cases have come in that way. Um, I do know that um, I work on a team who we are in a more of a specialized case management, if you want to call it, and so we're often at um, the courthouse, and if we know that our client has a warrant out for whatever reason, um, and they're supposed to be there that day, we'll say like, call your, the attorneys will call and, you know, try to help work that out so that our clients aren't getting arrested or like, don't come into this courthouse today. Like it's a big formal hearing. Don't come in here. Cause if you come in here, they're going to arrest you. So let's figure out how to straighten this out. But I don't, I don't know a time where my clients have called 211 and um, 911 has arrived. I don't know that I have that experience. I think it was more, I'm sorry, I just was scrunching it up, but I, you did answer the question, right? So even though, so I'm just using 211 because people know that you call 211 for resources, you call 911 for the police to come help you. So you, you kind of answered that where you have to warn or protect your clients um, getting the resources they need from the police or you know that today's the day they're going to try and get you or, or what have you. So... I'm just clarifying it for everyone else so that, it, <laughs> I, I like I said, I just used shorthand, but it, it, it's not literal. I'm sorry. No, that's All okay. Right. I, I'm just, I guess my point is, um, I don't think ever or often my coworkers and um, the teams that we work with in the courthouse that we do want to see our clients arrested. Um, I think we try more so to help them um, fix the situation they're in so that way we can continue to give them the resources they need and not have that barrier of incarceration along with whatever else they're going with. Thank you. Keisha? I'll say I think that is because we're in a racially divided world and I think that is why. Um, if you have people that again going back to people that's in charge of these systems um, in certain areas and places and whatnot um, what's going on right now? People know that it's a lot of heat between um, the police department and persons of color. 
Um, and so if you have people that's running these systems and places, jobs, companies, what have you, that feel this way, again, because we are racially divided right now, they're going to use that to their advantage. And so they are, th that's their first thought. Um, when dealing with persons of color, like if they deal with inter, um, certain, if you notice on Facebook, you see a lot of people, um, different outcomes, different situations, different people. You see people have confrontations with um, white people. A lot of times they yell at them, they let them yell, they let them do what they want, and then they get to go home that day. Um, they have the same encounter with a black person, person of color. Um, it's, well, I'm going to call security, I'm going to call police. So if that's always the the um, end measure, that's why it's going to keep continue, continuing. Again, we are racially divided right now. So that has a lot to do with, again, like I said before, power, people who hold the power. If they're not being held accountable, like you working outside of this person, you know how they treat people, you know their thoughts, you know how they handle business. People have got to start looking at each other and like, look, you wrong. You know what I'm saying? That is not how you have to handle it. Just because this black woman came in here and raised her voice, why do you have to call the police? So it's, it's, if, if we have uh, a racially divided place and space that we are in right now, and you have persons using that to their advantage, then um, yeah, it, it goes back to just like who you're working with, who's working at your company, who's holding it, who, who caused the shots. Kenneth? Yes. Um, and, and so back to that connection, you know, 211911, some kind of way um, when needing help is criminalized, you know, and, and, and I'll speak on, on mental health, you know, um, the perception or the stigma that if someone is experiencing mental health issues or crisis, um, they're dangerous. And, and so, you know, a social worker may not go out alone without the police being involved. Um, again, the neighborhood that I'm, that's, that needs the help or the zip codes that needs the most help, you know, are deemed as um, high risk neighborhoods or neighborhoods with the high crime rate. So we need the police to be involved to respond, you know? And, and so um, I think it has been a, a, a good push to trying to change that narrative or even now that's, that's some of the things that we're fighting for as far as like having the community respond to certain um, issues. But again, that, you know, that stigma, stigma to, um, the stigma behind that and, and mental health and um, again, you know, um, people that's, that's experiencing um, a mental health crisis does not mean they're dangerous. You know, um, if, if I respond or if even, I don't know, CPS, uh, when they come out sometime, they have um, the police come out if they have to remove a child. Well, yeah, because the, the um, majority of people that I know don't, you know, they will fight for their kids to not be removed from the home. So, you know, it can become a hostile situation. But, you know, uh, when we look at the police, it is not always the answer um, to go out to a social services call. You know, um, if I'm homeless and I'm sleeping in front of your store, you know, the police is called, not a social services agency, right? Or if I'm experiencing a chaotic experience, um, episode and I'm in the neighborhood and I'm talking to myself and I'm running up and down the street, the police is called not a social services agency. So, you know, again, when we talk about changing policy and, 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 and you know, per se defunding the police is those type of things. Should the police really be responding to those type of calls? And are they adequately trained to respond to those type of calls? Because if you show up and you pull up and you draw a gun on me, and I'm having a psychotic episode, that's, you know, it, it may not be a good outcome. And nine times out of 10, it would not be a good outcome versus someone that's coming in and looking at to be de-escalating the situation. So when we start to go in and de-escalate and stop looking at um, crisis services as one that is in need to be criminalized or the, the police to be involved, there will be a, a, a significant change. 
Um, I think that to add some insight, um, I want to again talk about something that I've recently um, seen or encountered. Um, and so social media, I think, has been putting a, a big spotlight on the injustices that are happening. Um, and so recently I saw something about how um, there was a black man in um, a house um, and, you know, whatever the case was, if it was being rented for like an Airbnb or something of that sort, um, that was his business. Um, but his two um, Caucasian neighbors um, took it upon themselves to question why he was there um, and then further took it a step um, and entered the house without without like asking, without ringing a doorbell, they just entered the house. Um, and so there's this, this perspective of the man sh showing the video, um, questioning these people, like, why did you just enter my house? And they're asking, or, um, <clears throat> they're saying, well, we've never seen you before, whatever, whatever. Um, so they took it upon themselves and um, he was just recording, he was documenting it. Um, and so then when that was posted, I read the comments um, because I feel like, again, that provides a lot of insight on perspective. And a lot of people were saying, well, why didn't he call the police? Why didn't he call, call the police? Like, why was he just recording? Um, but I think that although I never saw his response to it, I think that it is, you know, not to speak for him, but to kind of understand he's a black man and calling the police in a situation with two white people could go very wrong for him. Regardless if he was the one calling the police, those people have, you know, two allies, each other. Um, and the police, you know, historically has been the ally of the white people. So unfortunately, you know, white people get to call or, you know, you know, non BIPOC people get to call the police and they don't have to worry, oh, will this, this person think that I, I was the one in the wrong? Will they turn their perspective on me? Will I be the one asking for help, but still end up the one in trouble? Um, and so, although it doesn't necessarily tie into that 211, um, you know, 911, um, I think that it, it definitely, you know, adds some type of insight that unfortunately, historically, um, you know, calling the police has not worked well for BIPOC people, even when they're absolutely in the right. It has not worked well. Um, and so that has unfortunately allowed us to feel like we can't call people that are meant to protect us. Um, and yet our counterparts are still able to do it comfortably. Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, Mariah, this is a question to you. Um, in Milwaukee, the question of resources in Black, Indigenous, people of color neighborhoods has historically been contingent on state aid and revenue sharing. How much of your work as advocates, activists, and I'm, I'm sure anyone can jump in as well. Um, how much of your work as advocates, hold on, <laughs> they moved the question on me, uh, <laughs> is geared towards revising state power control challenging budget austerity and combating the redistricting that allows for conservative majorities in Madison. Um, community control and private funding resources matter, but the state has played an important role of historically, role historically, and that support will need to be there if we successfully defund local police. So to take out all the $20 words, how has the state contributed to the, the crisis that we see with policing and with the systemic racism in our state? Um, I'll start with Mariah and then if, if you want to jump in or please feel free. Um, I think specifically in child welfare in Milwaukee, it's very different than any other county in the state. Um, so for that don't know really quickly. In the 90s, there was a lawsuit that started against child uh, welfare in Milwaukee County because of the length of time kids were spending in care and the lack of permanency and things of that sort. Um, there was a settlement agreement that came out of that which said that a county can't hold on to the ongoing services. So if a family is assessed to need services, it has to, um, the services like case management have to come from a, another agency. And so right now in Milwaukee County, there's two agencies that hold that. Um, and part of that settlement agreement is in order for it to go back to the county, as it's my understanding, there's a bunch of benchmarks that they have to meet consistently. And we look at things uh, about how long kids are in care, like can they be reunified within 12 months? Um, are they getting their medical, their dental needs met? How times are we seeing kids? How quickly are we getting certain court reports in and things of that sort? 
Um, and when I was thinking about like this presentation, this panel today, and I was thinking about that, um, I was thinking about how they're not looking at how are we spending the money on our families in that reporting. Um, we're not looking at, we're, we're assessing all these different um, areas of the kids that are coming into care and the families that we're working with, but we're not assessing um, the disproportionality of like the makeup of these people. We're not assessing um, who is giving the services. So do our agencies look diverse? What kind of um, people are supposed to be helping the people in the communities? And so I think that's a big one. And I, I mean, I won't say what agency I work for, but I will say that I'm very proud to work for the agency that I do. Um, I think that a lot of our trainings, even prior to 2020, when everyone's jumping on this bandwagon, and a good bandwagon, by the way, of um, like racial um, inequality in our systems and things like that, these are conversations that my agency has been having for, for as long as I've been there, and I've been there almost six years, so prior to me. Um, and so I think that we look at that, and my agency looks at that and looks at who are we hiring and how can we continue to diversify. Um, and so I know that wasn't at the state level, but as a micro um, person in this in the field that I am, like those are things that I look for in in the agencies I work for. And so we are controlled a lot by our county and our state, um, but our agencies do have discretion in who they're hiring um, to an extent um, in terms of like what the qualifications are. But I think that's a, a a really big one for me is the diversity and how are we using these these tools. Um, I would like to see other things happen. I know I talked about kinship earlier. In the last few years, uh, the state changed the daycare requirements that families get. So if I take in a relative, but I don't receive kinship because I don't apply for it or I don't um, qualify for it for whatever reason, the state also won't help me with childcare. So that puts a burden on families too. Um, Whereas if I'm a foster parent, I'm no matter what my income level is, I, I qualify for it. And so th that's something that our agencies are not um, in charge of and we wish would change. And um, But when it changed that way, we saw a lot of our families kind of hurt. Um, and so that's resources that's invaluable to so many people that is needed. Thank you. I want to add to that to say that what Mariah said earlier about the basic life skills, life needs funding is something that really needs to happen because um, you are correct from like a lot of the conversations we have in the community. If people have their basic um, needs met, that it would it wouldn't be so much of a hardship. Um, I think the state enables the behavior that you mentioned um, because they are only generous to oppressive programs. Um, why are they not funding the programs that have helped? Um, folks instead of funding the programs that oppress people. So I just wanted to add that. And so um, I would like to add to that um, because of Milwaukee, you know, um, again, I get to highlight some of the things that we're doing at, in Milwaukee County um, Behavioral Health Division and, you know, with everything that's going on, you know, we have been shifting or moving towards a community-based model. And, and so when the question was asked, um, you know, how do we get more services in the community? Um, the response was the work in the community, right? And so everybody knows or, or BHD Behavioral Health Division is on Watertown Plank Road in Wauwatosa. Um, may be a, a hard place for some to get. They may get pulled over. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's not in the community. So what we have been doing or what we're doing now is um, actually partnering with community health centers. Um, so we partner with 16th Street Clinic, um, Progressive Health Clinic, as well as Outreach um, Health Clinic. And we're looking at partner with Isaac Cox um, as well. So what that looks like is we're actually um, housed in those facilities in the community and we're providing behavioral health services. So I, I think it's a great move. Um, so 
the people in the community can actually have access to services instead of um, going out to Wauwatosa or trying to make it to BHD. We're right there stationed in their community. Um, and, and so those are the projects that I'm currently over and, and, and I'm excited about it to see um, how we can better serve the community and give them access to those type of services. Um, so, and, and so with, um, and with the new county exec, you know, we have a new, new vision or is one county, one vision by achieving uh, racial equality. And so moving towards that type of model and, and continuing to, you know, ask the community what is needed and how we can better serve you. Um, there's a, uh, a negative, um, coint it's, it's negative um, when it comes to BHD and the services because of you know, the location and past experiences um, that some people may have had with the big, the, uh, with Milwaukee County Behavioral Health Division. So we're working hard to train, to change that. Again, you know, being out in the community, seeing how we can better serve the community. Um, and so I think it's just a great model, a great way to shift um, to the community-based um, model. Thank you, thank you. All right, to our final question, how can systems you work in with, work in or with, and or with, better amplify the voices of those impacted by systemic racism and bias? How can those systems and services be reshaped and rethought so that they are guided by those impacted voices to become liberatory rather than compounding oppression? Um, I'll give you guys each a couple minutes to answer the question. I to rephrase it because I rephrase everything because that's just what I do. Um, how does what you do now, your involvement, your your work, um, help to amplify the voices and to identify the problems? And then um, how can, and Kayla, you've already spoken to a little bit about what with behavioral health you just, you know, is doing, but you might want to expound a little bit more on your part. What What are you doing to help make that happen um and how does that and how does it guide um brianna let's start with you okay um that's a great question um i recently spoke at a rally um that also had like a close um topic to defunding the police and the start of my um little i guess blurb or speech um was that i'm a uwm student um I am a Afro-Latina woman. Um, I am a lit fellow. And I use that because I felt like the intersections of my identity should, should mix comfortably and, and you know well, they shouldn't conflict. Um, yet when I stood there, I felt conflicted, you know, that my university um, you know, was the most diverse school in the UW system and XYZ, but still had ties to, to police. Um, which as we've talked about openly oppressed um, BIPOC people um, and so unfortunately while I go to school I feel like that is um, you know a, a poor mix of my identities and I, I don't get to go to school comfortably and feeling completely represented with lit I absolutely have been um, it, it's my first um, you know activism um, kind of job um, and to be able to do it in Milwaukee I feel like is a prime place because I feel like a lot of people think of Milwaukee as you know the most diverse place and it is but they don't they don't think about you know segregation when I came to UWM again they advertised we're the most diverse school in the UW system come to us whatever whatever but didn't tell us the drawbacks and, and there definitely has to be you know transparency um, and so again reflecting back to lit um, I feel like there is so much consistency. When I wake up, I feel like I don't have to remove my identity when I'm doing my work. I get to use my identity in my work. Um, and so, um, unfortunately, another perspective of where I haven't been able to do that is I was thinking about interviewing um, <clears throat> for a job, in, like an internship next summer, um, because when I came to Milwaukee, I was like, there's all these Fortune 500 companies, yay. Um, and um, unfortunately, I was just recently in one of the stores that that company has. And um, I asked if they had a black hair care section. And um, the lady responded, or no, I just said hair care. And the lady responded, what kind of hair? And I was like, um, black hair. And she was like, honestly, no. 
she was like, we just have Diva Curl and you know how that is. Backstory to that, Diva Curl dries up hair. I used it, terrible experience. Um, but it was really unfortunate to see because I was I was thinking about interviewing for that company because I had seen, you know, their their Instagram takeovers talking about, you know, black lives and talking about this fight for racial justice and things like that. Yet in their own store, they didn't have a section that represented us. And so there was this lack of consistency. Like you can't ride the wave of, you know, liberation. And just because you're seeing it on social media, you're like, oh, as a company, we're accountable to, to say something about it, but then not really be about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like there's a lot of for-profit companies that are just now speaking up, but racial injustice has been here for 400 plus years. It's not a trend. It's not something you can just now get a part of or get on the bandwagon. Um, and so I think that, you know, the companies that we work with um, and work for um, should amplify our voices in every level, corporate level to, you know, the ground level, every single thing. If that means, you know, in the way to do it and reshape it, if that means bringing in more diverse perspectives, if that means having real conversations, do something because something is better than nothing and saying that you're, you're fighting for justice because fighting for justice is not post a hashtag it's not you know half again liberation is not a half act thing it is something you do day in and day out and people BIPOC people can speak to that BIPOC people know that because every day we go out into the community and we're BIPOC you know so absolutely just every day consistency ground level corporate level Keisha um, I just want to real quickly say that um, Black started Black Leaders Organizing for Community started in 2017, and our goal was to go in the neighborhoods, in the communities um, of color, and ask one question: What does it look like for the neighborhood to thrive? So, in doing that, we heard a lot of different issues from people in the communities, and I, I mean a lot of different issues. And so we created the block agenda in hopes to hold elected officials accountable. Like it's, it's enough of having these people in these positions for the sake of just taking up the positions to say, I'm this person, I'm your alderman, I'm um, your representative for this, this district or what have you. Um, we created the block agenda to help hold those people accountable because um, it has to start somewhere. And that is the only way to get these people voices heard and needs met. Um, we also employ 73 ambassadors. Um, our goal is to make sure that we are employing people kind of on a long-term tip so they can provide for their families. We have 73 ambassadors right now that have been employed with us for months and they are um, able to take care of their family. And so we know it's a small step, but it has to start somewhere. We have to um, bring relief to our communities. And so in our organization, that's what we do. We make sure that the issues are uplifted and they're not just being um, tucked away and therefore creating a more um, unsustained community. So um, I know for sake of time, but yeah, just check us out. And yeah, I hope that um, all of us in all our positions are can collectively make sure that we come together to create some kind of relief. Thank you. Mariah and then Kenneth. Um, I guess in my position, it's, you know, not just looking at what's on paper. In my practice, I tend to not read case files until I get to know my families. Um, you know, I really want to come in and say, I really don't care what the piece of paper says, like, tell me what's going on, like, what happened, how did we get here, and what do we need to move forward? Um, and I think that our Again, my agency I work for really encourages us to be open about and vocal about our opinions on small issues and large issues. And they don't just say that it's not just like a training that we have, you know, once a year or whatever. Um, they hold, you know, like sessions where we can come in and talk. Our CEO and our presidents and everyone is in, in the room together virtually right now. But, um, you know, it's, it's continued conversations that we have it's, it's okay to make others uncomfortable with what we're feeling and what we're saying. We're supposed to be open and honest. And if we can do that <clears throat> as an agency with our coworkers, um, we should be able to do that in the community with our families too. And really take the hard things that they're saying to us and evaluate what we do and how we practice 
that way we could best serve them. And yes, so earlier, I mean, a little while ago, I spoke about, you know, Milwaukee County, but I can definitely speak about some of the things that I've been doing and what I would continue to do. Um, you know, as, as a black therapist, you know, I continue to be on panel and, and and continue to try to break the stigma when it comes to mental, um, mental health, you know, and just changing the perspective of what people think mental health or mental illness is and how we can continue to um, break that or change the, the stigma behind that. Um, also, uh, I have a training center. Um, I actually train people in the community um, to become substance use um, counselors and, you know, just teach them how to do assessments and treatment plans and that type of thing. Um, I've been working with um, Dream, Team U, Dream Team MKE. Um, we've been giving away free food, so free food giveaways. Um, last, last Sunday, uh, we was on Silver Spring, and this Sunday we'll be out again giving away food. Um, and I say giving away food, I mean, you know, sometimes we do over 500, 600 pounds of, of, of chicken and, and different fruits and vegetables. And so I've, I've been actively doing that. Um, also, I've been working um, with Calm Force a lot and, and going out um, in the community. Um, again, I get a lot of phone calls and, and people reach out to me um, just as a black therapist uh, to, co to speak with youth. And so I'm very, very active in the community. I'm gonna continue to be active in the community. Um, it's, it's something that I believe in. And, and so I fight hard to change the narrative or perspective of how people um, actually view black men. And because I'm in the field of social work, it's not a lot of black men that actually um, work in, with social work or work with people, I should say. Um, and so the narrative needs to be changed that we are loving and caring and we can be nurturers as well. So um, that, that stigma behind how we were portrayed um, for years, you know, again, with the police response and, and different things of that nature, you know, um, we are loving and caring and we do care about the community. So, you know, I fight hard to continue to uh, work on that piece. But yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful and thankful that you guys um, invited me today and I'm gonna continue to um, do work like this um, to, to, to share, the, share my story, share the story of the community, what I witnessed. Um, so yeah, and, and thank you and, I am just in awe of all four of you. Amazing, amazing individuals giving up your time, your heart, and the space. And I know how hard it is to hold this space when you are both trying to heal and help those that look like you and be in this space looking like us. Um, so I know we, we kind of walk that double-edged sword, you know, of grace and health and, and also trying not to get cut too deep. If you know, I think you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for showing up. Thank you for sharing your truths. And thank you for the work you are doing in the, in the community in Milwaukee. I know it's going to make, I know it makes a difference. Or else we wouldn't be able to have this panel, this conversation. So that concludes our talk. Thank you for your time, for your, for your love. And thank you everyone who showed up and participate participated and I don't know if you guys can see the chat but I think there's a few comments in the chat just say